Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day. We're back again with more Black Geyser. And this time I want to go through the skills and spells that are available in the game. It's a long list that varies based upon what type of class you're playing. And so I'm sure there's some of you who are unclear on what you really need to focus on and what you can safely ignore. Hopefully this video is going to give you some good information. Just a quick note, we are going to have to flip through different classes because different classes will have a different list of skills or spells available to them. And there are some companions you get that will be specific classes. In the event that I have a companion that fills a particular class, I'm going to switch over to them when we're looking at the spell list because this interface only allows us to see level one spells, whereas most of my party members are level nine. So I'll have the opportunity to show you the descriptions of some of the later level spells. If for whatever reason you do not want to see any information regarding the companions, you can go ahead and go into the chapter list that is below and then skip to the next section when I'm about to go into a companion spell list. I'm not going to mention any additional information about the companions, such as where you get them or what their personalities are like or anything like that. But I know there are some of you who just don't want to see anything about the companions period. So you will be able to skip around as you see fit. Okay. And with that being said, let's go ahead and dive in from the top. So first up, you have the general selection of skills, and these three are going to be the same, no matter what class it is that you're playing. Bargain and persuasion is obviously for you to be able to persuade people and for you to get better prices with vendors. You definitely want at least one person who's very skilled in this on the team. It does not need to be your main character. You're going to run into multiple party members early on who are skilled with this in a way that will carry you throughout the game. But there are multiple opportunities for you to be able to persuade people that are beneficial to you. So you definitely want at least one person that has this. Learning and research is your ability to copy recipes in your compendium, which when you're trying to craft using brewing and drying, it's going to give you a little list of recipes over on the right side of your screen that you can then select so you can see what ingredients you need in order to create a specific potion or powder. So you definitely want somebody who's skilled in this. In addition, this skill determines for a spellcaster their ability to scribe scrolls into their spell book. Now, everybody who is able to cast spells is not necessarily able to scribe from scrolls. For example, the cleric cannot scribe scrolls into her spell book. So you have to figure out whether or not you have a class that is capable of doing this. But if you have that type of class, such as a spell weaver or a convoker, then you definitely want that person leveling up in that skill so that they're able to get additional spells. Brewing and drying is the crafting mechanism in the game. You definitely want at least one person who is very skilled in this area. It's going to allow you to create potions that will provide your party with healing and give them buffs against certain resistances and just buffs in general that are gonna make them more tanky or able to do more damage. And then you're also going to get powders that can be used to put debuffs on your enemies or do direct damage to them. Also, there is an interface in the game that allows you to set party members to automatically use potions and powders. So you don't have to manually handle all of that even if you're creating a lot of potions and powders, you can just give them to your party members and then they'll decide for themselves when is a good time to be able to use it. So I definitely believe, again, you should have at least one person working on this and using all of those ingredients that you're picking up. So now we get into the class specific section. So looking at the cleric, they have theology, which is going to give you additional dialogue choices themed around faith. Now, this is a very interesting part of the game. You have bargain and persuasion, which is going to give you persuasion options in the game. And then all of the classes have a specific class skill that gives you dialogue choices 
in a specific type of conversation. This is a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's very, very cool. A lot of times the options you'll get from theology or some of the other ones are more interesting than what you get from bargain and persuasion because bargain and persuasion is going to give you the vanilla persuasion option. Whereas theology is specifically centered around faith. So it's going to be a much more interesting selection. However, theology only works when it's specifically a conversation regarding faith, where you have the ability to persuade somebody, whereas bargain and persuasion is available in all dialogues where persuasion is an option. So theology, even though it's going to provide you with cool response options, it's also always going to be redundant to bargain and persuasion. So you can make your own decision about whether or not that's actually worth it to you. Tend to wounds is going to increase the amount of health you gain after arrest. You definitely want one or two people who are putting a couple of points into this. It is a skill where all of the party members that have ranks into it will help to increase how much health you gain from arrest. And if you just left this at zero, uh, I was finding that I was resting, but not being fully healed. So you don't need to level this up all the way, but you want, I think I have um, a couple of people totaled it up to about four, maybe five points in this. And so I feel like that's enough to ensure that you're getting at least a good amount of help. There are still times where I rest, where I'm not fully healed, but I have a cleric, so I can always use some additional healing spells if I really need to. Pray allows you during rest to pray to your deity and then hopefully receive certain boosts or buffs that you can use while you're going through the world. I almost never use this. Uh, I tried it once, I think, and wasn't impressed with the results. So it could be a situation where if you pump this really high, you could get some really, really nice buffs. But at the same time, the game provides you with all the gear, potions, powders, and spells that you need in order to get through it just fine. So this is probably to some degree redundant with what you're already able to do. And then finally, you have abolished curses. So... There are some points in the game, supposedly, where you're going to get items that are cursed and they're going to have negative effects, which you will be able to purify with this skill point so that only the positive effects would remain. I have completed three acts and I'm 20 plus hours into the game. I have never encountered a cursed item. So thus far, again, I would say this isn't worth it, but... There might be a situation where in the last two acts, all of a sudden you get a bunch of really powerful cursed items and you're going to wish that you had this skill. So if that's the case, I'll certainly update this. But being more than halfway through the game, I've never found a use for this particular skill. And then you're always going to have the list of weapon skills that are available to you. If you are someone like a cleric or a spellcaster, more than likely you're going to want to stick to one of these. You have to get it up to 15 in order to be able to max it out. And if you're not getting additional weapon points, then it's not going to be possible to max out multiple weapon types. But if you're playing as a fighter, most especially, then you're going to get additional weapon points and you have a lot of flexibility as far as what you want to do. Now, you do get a cleric party member. So for the spell list, I'm going to flip over to her. My cleric is a level nine, which means she has spell slots all the way up to level four. Unfortunately, I can't comment right now on what spell slots five, six, and seven actually look like. But for the spells that I do have, first is Hand of Mercy, which is a single target healing spell, definitely effective early in the game. Next up is Peace, which allows you to inflict Pacified upon an enemy, which means they will not be able to attack for two turns. Very, very effective, especially against enemies that do a high amount of damage with their attacks. Love that spell. And then there's also Serenity, which allows you to remove Pacified from one of your party members and instead gives them alert, which gives them increased resistance to the category of depressive effects by 25%. And that also lasts for three turns. Very nice. Now, if we go to the elevated energy spells, 
She has never sleep, which is going to grant alert once again, but removes a sleep from the target. And then we also have red sun rises, which is going to grant strength, which increases your physique by two and increases your weapon damage dealt by 25, 20%. And then they also get inspired status effect chance increased by 25%. So basically it's going to allow you to do a lot more damage in combat. And then finally, for level one, there's Armor of Alnarius, which is going to grant Harden, which gives you increased resistance to slashing effects and damage by 25%, Reinforce, which increases your resistance to stabbing effects and damage, and then Bracing, which increases your resistance to pulse and blow effects and damage by 25%. So essentially, it's going to make you much, much tankier against physical damage. This is an absolutely fantastic spell for her and helps her survive upfront combat. Then looking at level two, um, for elevated energy spells, we have Glare of the Jin, which is going to inflict stunned on one target for two turns. They'll be unable to act, move, or evade attacks. And then she also has Mystic Bulwark, which is going to grant shielding, absorbing up to 25 damage of any source. And then also notice that many of these powers mention that they scale up to a certain level. So that means whatever effect it provides as you level up is going to provide an increased effect. And even in the case of a situation like the armor of Alnurs, which it's already providing specific statuses, so those are not necessarily going to get better. However, the amount of time that this buff lasts on her will increase significantly as she levels up. So now it's to the point that when I turn this on, even if I'm going through one of the larger dungeons, I can get about halfway through before I need to turn this back on again. So it's very, very nice. Then if we look at the base energy level two spells, we have Calm, which is going to remove panic from one of your party members. And when they're panicked, they cannot act voluntarily and cannot be controlled. And then she also gets Chattering, which is going to inflict silence, which renders an enemy unable to cast spells for two turns. And it's going to give distraction, which reduces an enemy's chance to dodge, block, and parry by 10% for two turns. Both of these are definitely very effective. I haven't had to use Calm much, but Chattering, you're going to run into a bunch of spellcasters where this is very, very useful for you. Then at level three, for base energy spells, we have Berserk, and it's going to grant Enraged, which increases your attack speed and your weapon damage dealt, but decreases your dodge and block, and it makes you immune to Charm, Confused, and Panic. And it's going to also provide Indomitable, which means you're immune to movement impairing effects. So this can be really, really nice to put onto your tanks. Dazzling Light is going to inflict Blinded, which means you're unable to use ranged attacks and aim and accuracy decreased by 50%. And your chance to parry or block an attack is decreased by 50%. And it's going to provide distraction, which we've already talked about. So it's a great way to debuff multiple hostile creatures at the same time. Very nice stuff. Healing Mist allows your caster to be surrounded with a mist that is going to heal allies for a certain amount every single turn. This is absolutely a fantastic power. It's massive healing that applies to your entire team. And it's just great to be able to pop this on, especially since she's a frontline fighter. It also allows her to mitigate damage that your allies might be taking during a really, really hard fight. And then Life Funnel allows you to expend your own life force in order to try to heal another target. So you're going to take 3 to 12 damage, but then heal the target for 31 damage. Very, very nice. I never use it because usually there's enough hand of mercy and healing mist that it'll be fine. Plus, I'm creating posters all the time. So all my characters have posters that they'll use if they get really low. But it's a nice option for you. And then for elevated energy spells, you have Dance of the Desert Wind, which is going to grant steady, which is focus increased by one, aim and accuracy increased by 20% for one turn, and quicken, which is going to increase your chance to dodge and movement speed by a certain amount. And it's going to do it to creatures affected within an area of effect. So you can do this for the entire party at one time. 
And then you're also going to get Mind Break, which is going to confuse targets, attacking allied and hostile creatures alike, and they have a chance to choose a new target each turn. So this is great to put on an enemy that's all the way in the back of the line, because then you can be absolutely sure they're only going to be targeting their friends, and you can focus on trying to whittle everybody else down. Then looking at level four for elevated energy, we have transcendent meditation, which is going to grant focused, which means you cannot be interrupted by damage and you're immune to depressive and illusion and manipulation effects for two turns and anticipating, which increases your chance to dodge and parry by 15% for two turns. And then if you go to the base energy spells, divine aid is going to restore a specific person's health. In this case is two to 28 heat damage to the target or living creatures are healed for 31 health. So in some cases, you are able to use healing spells to damage the undead. And then you also have Sands Give Shelter, which this spell summons the protective forces of the desert to envelop its target, granting Harden, Reinforce, which we've already talked about, Bracing, which increases your resistance to pulse and blow effects and damage by 25%, Warm, which gives you uh, increased resistance to heat effects and damage by 25%, Fortified, and cool link so this is just absolutely fantastic protection to help you stay up front and in the fight those are the cleric spells that i'm aware of at this time i'll definitely do an updated video for all the spells when i have everybody maxed out Next up is Convoker. As you can see, she has the same list of general skills, but a completely different list of class skills. First up is Prodigy, which is just like Theology, except instead of the conversation being about faith, it needs to be about magic use or wizardry. Arcane Studies increases the amount of elevated energy level spells that you have. So if you looked at the spell listing for Cleric, you'll see that there's two different types of spells that you get at each level. Arcane Studies is going to ensure that you have more slots of the elevated energy level spells, which are very limited. So if you want to be the best magic user you could possibly be, this obviously is a skill that you would want to invest in. Magical Perception determines your ability to sense traps of a magical nature. So there are traps of a magical nature that usually do some type of elemental damage if you trigger them. And then there are traps of a mechanical nature that do just regular damage if you trip over them. So this skill allows you to specifically see magical traps. And there are plenty of them in the game. So this is obviously worth investing into. Magical warding helps to ensure that when you're resting, you are not jumped by random beasts that are in the area. I did not invest in this at all. And thus far, I think I've rested in the field maybe seven or eight times and I've only been jumped once. So I would say I don't really feel like this is worth investing into, but if you're playing on harder difficulties, I'm flipping back and forth between classic and veteran. So, and I know there's one higher than veteran. So if you're playing on a much harder difficulty, it might be worth going ahead and doing this. But otherwise, I would say that you can safely ignore this skill. Now, you, I haven't run into a party member that's a convoker, but my character that I rolled is actually a convoker. So let's switch over to that so I can walk you through some of the spells. So this is the spell book for my main character, which is a level nine convoker. If we look at the base energy spells at level one, I have Corrosive Bolt, which is actually from the natural school, not summoning. But remember, convokers can scribe spells. So I'm able to pick up some extra spells that may not be in the actual standard spell list. But this spell does um, poison and acid damage to one particular target. And then I also have Elenoator's Boots, which is part of the Oriental class of spells, but it provides Quicken to one particular target. And then we have Summon Spider. So when I first got this around level one, when I used it, I think I summoned two Forest Crawlers. But now that I'm up to level nine with this one casting, I'm going to summon six Forest Crawlers for three turns. 
just absolutely fantastic stuff. And as you can see, I could just fill up my base energy list with that spell and just keep these summons out as long as I want to. For my elevated energy spells, I have Magic Egg Scorpion. So this allows me, at first level, it was just going to summon one egg and then a scorpion would pop out of that egg after one turn. Now, the cool thing about this is the egg actually immediately makes enemies hostile. So enemies will attack the egg even before it actually hatches a scorpion. So it's a great distraction for you right up front. But now that I'm at a higher level, it summons two eggs that both hatch scorpions. And I think for every three scorpions that hatch, then greater scorpions come out. So really, really nice spell to have, but it's in the natural class. I stick with pure summoning, so I go with Wasp Assault, which actually does direct stabbing damage to a particular target. Then if we look at level two, for my elevated energy spell, I have Crypt Opening Skeleton, which is actually of the unnatural class, essentially a Necromancer. And at first level, it would just summon one skeleton. Now it summons <laughs> summon one skeleton. Now it summons three skeletons for three turns. Very nice. We've already talked about Mystic Bulwark. And then for base energy, identify, if you're familiar with D&D, you know what this is for. It lets you identify magic items that you loot in the world. And if you have, I think it's a high enough intelligence, you can go ahead and identify these items without actually having to use a slot or a spell. And so it hasn't been a problem for me. Unbearable heat allows you to do heat damage on enemies based on how heavily armored they are. So against enemies with heavy armor, this can do a, a fairly nice amount of damage. And then finally, the one I use is Summon Wolf. So at this point, when I use the spell, it's going to summon four wolves for three turns. And then looking at level three for base energy, we have Summon Goblin. So when I use this, it summons two goblins for three turns. As, as far as the effectiveness of these spells, all of them are very, very effective for distracting enemies. Um, as far as the amount of damage that they do, it's, it's okay because I'm a Convoker. I think if I was using any other class, um, it probably wouldn't be all that great, but the Convoker, of course, directly assist in making the summons do more damage. So they're definitely helping in combat, but far more importantly, they're keeping the heat off of my tanks and my overall party. And then for elevated energy, we have Crypt Opening, which again is actually a necromancy spell, but it's going to summon three ghouls for three turns. And obviously it's very helpful. And then for level four, I don't think I have any, right, I don't have any elevated energy spells yet, but I have the base energy spell. And again, it's in the unnatural class and it allows me to summon two skeleton halberdiers for three turns. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but <laughs> you see the photo, you know what it means. And those guys are absolutely fantastic. Definitely like uh, popping this out and using it. Next up is Druid. Most of the class skills for Druid are the same as they were for Cleric, except instead of Prey, they have Dream. But it's the same basic principle. You dream and it allows you to connect with your deity and then you can ask your deity for a specific boon. You do get a Druid companion. So let's switch over to her so that I can walk you through the spells in her list. So I do have a level nine druid companion. A lot of these spells you've probably already seen before since she does specialize in nature, um, but she's already got Hand of Mercy, Eleanor Waiter's Boots, Serenity and Summon Spider. We went over those already. Same with Elevated Energy. These are ones we've already seen. If you look at level two, Glare of the Jinn is one we've seen. We have not talked about Entangle. So if you cast Entangle on a target, it's going to immobilize it, which means that target is unable to move. Then at level three, uh, again, we've seen Dazzling Light and Healing Mist. For Elevated Energy, we have Soul Twist. This spell calls forth a malevolent spirit to haunt any hostile targets in an area and it's going to inflict pacified which we've talked about before it doesn't allow enemies to attack and panic which we've also spoken about doesn't allow them to act voluntarily so 
Definitely nice debuff in a specific area. And then looking at level four, we've already talked about Transcendent Meditation. If we go to base energy, then we have Summon Lurker, um, which allows her to summon one Lurker for three turns. In fact, I have to look at that and see why I don't have that at level four. <laughs> and then she also has Verdant Growth, um, which is going to summon a group of Verdant Roots around a specific target imbuing them with natural healing energies and so at this time the spell is going to heal you for 45 health over three turns next up is fighter and as you can see fighter has a completely different list of class skills so first is seasoned warrior just like theology and prodigy except this time the dialogues have to be centered around being a warrior outdoor survival helps to increase the amount of health you get while you're resting outdoors. So it's similar to the other skill that I believe was on clerics. And then Command Company allows you to choose this particular character as your commander, which is going to give you a list of party-wide buffs you can choose from as you level up this particular skill. I actually have a party member who has a decent ranking in this. Let's flip over to him so we can look at the different options. Okay, so looking at my party, if I go into the character screen and then hit class skills, you see I've got a level seven in command company. So if you go back to that specific character, click on skills in the hot bar and then click on command company, you'll see that they'll have a list of perks that are available for you to choose from. And this list will expand as you increase their level in that particular skill. So right now I have Wolfpack selected, which means we're going to do an additional 15% damage anytime we are targeting the same enemy as the commander is. Hit and run, attack speed and movement speed of all party members is increased by 30% for three turns at the beginning of combat. Phalanx, block chance of all party members wielding shields increases by 15%. Hunters in the dark, aim and accuracy for all party members is increased by 15% during the evening. Evasive action, dodge chance, parry chance with an active melee weapon, and block chance with a shield or heavy armor equipped increases by 3% for all party members. And then finally, Havoc, physical damage dealt increased by 15%. Dodge and parry chance decreased by 5%. For all party members. And then finally, you have force locks and doors. So if for whatever reason, you don't have a party member who's able to unlock locks and doors, you can use this skill in order to be able to get past those locks. Mind you, it makes a lot more noise than it would if you had a thief in your party. And it's more effective against low level locks. So if you're in a dungeon where you're dealing with high level locks, you might run into a situation where this skill is not effective. I have a thief in my party, so I haven't really run into it. And I'm not sure how far you have to go before this skill loses its effectiveness. But I do know for a lot of the first three or four hours, I didn't have a thief and this was all I used and it was never a problem. Obviously as a fighter, you're going to have a large amount of weapons that you're able to level up in. And you can see you're going to get five points um, up on level up and a lot of points every time you level up to put into these weapons. So my fighter in my party is level nine and he already has three different categories already maxed out. Now, since I have a fighter, let's go ahead and flip over to him so that we can look at the abilities that are available for that class. First, you have Vigilance, which is going to give you Anticipating, Standing Firm, and Steady all at once. So it's a great way to ensure that you're able to do more damage towards enemies and make you a little bit more tanky. And then I really like the ability Challenging How, which is going to do a taunt to enemies in a five meters range. And this taunt is very, very effective, has people all ganging up on them. So as long as you have your tank buffed up to the point that he can take those hits, it's a great way to control the battlefield. Then next up, we have Prolonged Berserk, which is going to put enraged 
and Indomitable on your fighter. And then we also have Waylay. The user of this ability attempts a disabling attack against a target that aims to prevent their movement. The user's next attack inflicts a status effect on his target depending on the weapon's main damage component. It's either slow for slash, immobilize for piercing, or knockdown for pulse and blow. All of my fighters are melee based, so they do not have shattering shot, but this allows you to inflict brittle, exposed, and softened on a particular enemy, and your next attack will deal 20% increased damage. Everything on the skills and spells list for Highlander is the same as fighter, except they're missing one of the abilities that is going to make you a tankier fighter. Next up is Necromancer. All the skills in this list are the same as what you would see on Convoker. For the initial spells, most of them we've probably already went through with the companions. Death Pulse is gonna allow you to put waves of energy around yourself and it's gonna deal poison and acid damage to anyone caught in it. This includes party members, so you need to be careful with it. And then there's also Predator's Fangs. This spell lets the user tap into the life force of the target of their next attack, restoring their own health. Next attack steals life and deals four more damage, which will scale up, of course, as you level up. Next up is Ranger, who has the exact same skill list as the fighter, except the Ranger does not get access to Challenging Howl or the Taunt ability that Fighter has. Next up is Shaman, whose skill list is almost exactly the same as Cleric, except instead of Prey, they get Commune. Same concept, you commune with your deity and it'll give you a specific boon when you're resting. All the spells that are available at level one for Shaman have been covered either in other classes or other party members that we've went over in this video. Next up is Spellweaver. All the skills that are available for her are also available for the Convoker. You do get a Spellweaver party member, so let's go ahead and switch over to her so you can see some of the later spells that you'll have available. So at level one for base energy spells, she has Snow, which is going to do direct cold damage to one particular target. She also has Fever, which is going to inflict several debuffs onto a particular enemy enemy. Um, throbbing, which reduces their resistance to strain and pain. Toasting, re reducing their resistance to heat. And weak, which is going to reduce their physique by two and their weapon damage dealt by 50%. She also has Summon Spider and Hand of Mercy. We've went over those. Elevated Energy, she has the Armor of Alnarius and Stone Wall, which allows you to put up a thick wall in a particular area can be great for closing off choke points if you want to be able to cut off enemies. Um, for level two elevated energy spells, she has Ride the Lightning. Uh, move like lightning and leave some behind for anyone unfortunate enough to be nearby. The caster quickly jumps away to a targeted location in range while discharging a blast of lightning in a circular area around them. I haven't used this at all because obviously it affects party members, but if you do use it, it's going to do pulse and blow and heat damage to impacted targets. Then she also has jump, which allows her to teleport to a particular destination. And then we've already, I believe, spoken about crypt opening skeleton, which she has available. For base energy spells, she has Severine Sparkle, which is going to do heat and pulse and blow damage to a particular target. Um, we've already talked about summon wolf and unbearable heat and entangle and identify drain life. Um, this spell can be used to obviously leech the life force of a particular target. It's going to do a specific amount of slashing damage to the target and then heal you for 26 health. At level three, for base energy spells, we've already talked about healing mist, summon goblin and dazzling light. Gendamon's freezing fingertips is going to do cold and stabbing damage to a particular area of effect and it inflicts slow to affected creatures as well. So obviously this could impact your party members, but it could be a great way to open a fight if you know you're going up against enemies who are impacted by cold. And then for elevated energy spells, we've already talked about Dance of the Desert Wind and Crypt Opening Ghoul. 
Fireball. Does heat damage to enemies in a specific effect uh, or specific area. And then it also inflicts toasting and burning, which causes them to take heat damage each turn. And then at level four, for elevated energy spells, we have Acid Rain, which is going to do poison and acid damage to enemies within a particular area. And then it also inflicts Pervious, decreased resistance to poison and acid effects and damage by 25% for two turns. And then for base energy, you have Chain Lightning. Upon being cast, a crackling stream of lightning springs forth from the caster's palms, damaging the target on arrival. The stream will then jump to further hostile targets in range, damaging them in the process. This is going to deal heat and pulse and blow damage, and is going to inflict stunned on the target. And it's not letting me pull it up for some reason, but stun completely incapacitates the target, and makes it so they're not able to block or and or dodge any sort of attacks you do to them. So it's a very, very powerful debuff. Oh, and she actually does have level five power. So she has marching powder. Oh, that's right. She got this from a scroll. So I scribed this power from the scroll, but she's not able to actually select or use level five powers yet. But marching powder is going to give a buff to your allied targets. Um, and it's going to give them strengthened, inspired, and indomitable, which I believe we've talked about all of these before. And it's going to do this in an area of effect. Next up is Swindler, and they get their own separate class skills. Hide and Sneak allows you to be able to sneak through the detection range of enemies, and it enables you to do backstab attacks if you're able to sneak up on an enemy. Steal and plant items allows you to pickpocket enemies or neutral characters as well. And you can also plant items on them if you see fit, which means you can plant powders that would have a negative effect on that particular character. Pick locks allows you to pick all the uh, chest and lock doors that are in the game. Shady dealings is the dialogue option specifically for conversations dealing with outlaws. And then finally disarm traps. If they are of a mechanical nature, this skill will allow you to detect and disarm traps. I haven't really kept up with, do I encounter more mechanical traps or magic traps? I just increased levels in both of them and I feel like it's been worth it for the most part. And then of course, I've increased levels in pick locks. You're gonna run into a lot of locks in this game. I don't have a swindler, but my thief is someone who uses ranged attacks. So I haven't really played around with whether or not hide and sneak is worth it, but none of the skills automatically make you a sneaky character. So like you don't have something where automatically the character will go into sneak and then try to attack. So it's a manual process to go into hide and sneak and then try to sneak up on a character, especially in the middle of combat. So offhand, I'm going to say it's probably not really worth it. I haven't leveled this up at all. And there hasn't been a situation yet where I really wished I was able to sneak. Also for sneak and plant item could be wrong, but it seems to me that it's bugged. I have not been able to plant items at all. If I click on steal, I get the steal icon and I'm able to steal. Same with pick locks. If I click on the plant item icon, I get nothing. Like it highlights the box so the game recognizes that my mouse cursor is over the box. But when I click on it, nothing happens. And I don't have the ability to actually plant items on a character. But again, that might be... Um, something that they quickly fix, or maybe it's just that there's something additional you have to do to be able to plan items that's not clear right now. But again, I haven't invested in this at all, and there hasn't been a situation where I really wish that I had. Um, there is a list of abilities specific for the swindler, but it's the exact same for the thief as well. We'll go over it when we look at the thief. 
The Templar has the exact same list of skills and abilities as the fighter does, except they lose the option to be able to go berserk. At level four, you do get access to spells. I do not have a Templar party member, so unfortunately I can't tell you what kind of spells they get access to at that point. Next up is Thief. They get the same list of skills as the Swindler does. Let's switch over to a party member so I can walk you through the specific abilities that are available to the class. So as a Thief or a Swindler, you get four different abilities you can use. First one is Dirty Blow, which means your next attack has a 50% increased chance to cause a status effect. And the next stealth attack is going to inflict stunned against your enemy, while your next non-stealth attack inflicts silenced on the target. Then you also have Slayer's Intent, which is going to give you several buffs that are going to make it easier for you to actually hit and damage an enemy. Then you also have For the Eyes, which means your next attack is going to have a 30% increased critical strike chance, and it's going to have... Um, an increase of 30% to the damage that it does. The next backstab attack will inflict concussion on your target, which is going to decrease intelligence by two, and attack speed and casting speed are going to be reduced by 25%, or your next non-backstab attack will inflict blinded on the target. And then finally, you have malicious strike, which means your next attack has a 30% increased chance for it to be a critical strike, and your next attack deals 30% increased damage. Next up is the Winter Mage, who has the same list of skills as the Convoker and the Necromancer do. And all the spells that are available at level 1 have been covered either by different classes or party members that we reviewed in this video. So, that is the full list of spells and skills that I'm able to go over at this time. Like I said, once I've finished the game and I've maxed out more of the characters, I'll definitely revisit the spell list for you and show you some of those high-level spells and should probably show you them in practice during combat as well. So, looking forward to that video. But for now, hopefully this gave you some more information that you can use to determine what type of character you'd like to play. If you enjoyed this video, please leave me a like down below, share this content, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.